So Lord Jesus, we do just worship you, Lord. If that were ever to happen, what we just saying, what we're about to just read, um, if that were ever, were ever to happen, where we saw your glory like that, saw your holiness like that, saw your majesty like that, and that the train of your robe filled this temple, and the pillars over here shook, and the light of your glory entered, and we saw you like Isaiah saw you, Lord, we would be changed, and we would be transformed, and we would be made more and more into your image and likeness, and we would be never the same, and we would be affected by you. And so we pray. I think we pray, I hope we pray, <laughs> that the glory of the Lord and the awesomeness of his presence uh, would fall upon us. And all that could mean we can't even imagine. Mm -hmm. But we know that we long to see you like that. And we pray in Jesus' name. Father God, we just thank you, Lord, that you provide um, our hearts to be open for your worship. So we thank you, Lord God, that our hearts would be open to the message you would have provided for us this morning. That the weight of your glory would fall upon us, and I pray, Lord, it would be not too weighty. So we just thank you, Lord God, for what you provide, and thank you um, for the love that you provide for us. So Amen and hallelujah, Lord. We enter your gates with thanksgiving this morning, Lord, desirous of knowing your will and your way. Lord, we do gather in a spirit of worship and praise, Lord, to understand the weight of your glory, which is absolutely true. Your gloriousness is weighty. Lord, I pray that we would receive um, that glory this day, Lord, by the power of the Spirit, Lord. When this word comes forth, Lord, that it would... Um, it would affect our souls in such a way that we would be changed. Lord, that we'd leave these doors differently than when we walked in. And Lord, if we caught a glimpse of you, another glimpse of you, and another glimpse of you on our walk of this life, Lord, we would continually change into your image. Lord, as we look into your word, as we come together in, in praise and worship, Lord, that we would be changed into the image of the living God here on earth, Lord. That love would flow from us, Lord. That mercies uh, would be known, Lord, as we would love the Lord our God and we would love our neighbor. But, Lord, that can't happen, Lord, if we enter with dark hearts. So I pray, Lord, we've confessed our sin before you, Lord, that you called us to do. Lord, I pray, Lord, we've come for a cleansing in the spirit, a washing, a renewal, a rebirth, and all that goes along with it, Lord, that we are prepared to receive this, Lord. That we leave this dark world outside those doors, Lord, and rejoice in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Rejoice in grace and mercy in love and peace. So, Lord, that's why we're here. We thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for being a body drawn together for your purposes. So, Lord, bless us this morning from your word we pray. In Jesus' name. Good morning, brothers and sisters. What an amazing piece of scripture we have to look at together this morning. And we do think about so many brothers and sisters that aren't here. Surgeries and surgeries and so many others. Though we are small in number this morning, we're mighty in spirit. Hallelujah. The Lord leads us. But this morning, again, one of just so many incredible pieces of scripture from God's word. I have the privilege of reading you um, the entire chapter of Isaiah 6. And Lord God Almighty, I pray, Lord, you would cause all of us, like Isaiah saw you, Lord, to see you in your glory in a way we hadn't before. Lord, help us, I pray. So, you can find us on page 1,140 in our pew Bible. I don't think so, John. No? That's in Corinthians. Oh, how about 680? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm a lemming. Sorry about that. <laughs> That's okay. Thank you. <laughs> I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> page 680 in our pew Bibles. If you're able, please stand.
In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With two wings, they covered their faces. With two, they covered their feet. And with two, they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of His glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the threshold shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. He said, Go. Tell these people, be ever hearing, but never understanding. Be ever seeing, but never perceiving. Make the heart of this people callous. Make their ears dull and close their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. Then I said, For how long, O Lord? And he answered, Until the cities lie ruined and without inhabitant, until the houses are left deserted and the fields ruined and ravaged, until the Lord has sent everyone far away and the land is utterly forsaken. And then, though a tenth remains in the land, it will again be laid waste. But as the tavern and the oak leave stumps when they are cut down, so the holy seed will be the stump in the land. May God bless the reading of his word in your soul. You may be seated. Yeah, as the brother said, you know, no, this is one of the Mount Everest verses, chapters uh, here in the Bible. And um, the Lord Jesus. I don't really even know how you can add anything mm -hmm. Amen. to the words that are written there, Lord, that you spoke through the prophet Isaiah. And um, I'm undone. Amen. And so, Lord, um, we just pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit, help us to see uh, what you would want us to see. Holy Spirit, bring out and illuminate truth from your word here in spite of um, the frailty of man. And Lord, the frailty of man is speaking these words and the frailty of the men and women here in the congregation hearing these words, Lord, that we would so be affected and so moved and transformed by you. And we pray, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. So, the title is simply contemplating the holiness of God and the essential idea is simply Isaiah saw the holiness of God. He saw the majesty and glory of the Lord. He saw the magnitude and the gravity of his sin. And he saw the ministry given to him by the sovereign Lord. And we could spend, you know, as we say this every now and again, we could spend a lot just in Isaiah a long time in Isaiah 6, just 8 through 13, any part of it, we could. Um, we'll do our best here together this morning um, to look at this uh, awesome, awesome chapter in the Bible. Um, in the 
year of King Uzziah's death. So, in the year of King Uzziah's death, Isaiah saw two things. He saw a dead king, and he saw the eternal king. Uh, amen. And it's so neat, just the way it's worded there, the year of King Uzziah's death. He obviously, he saw something that he was never going to ever forget. And from a human, you know, minuscule human perspective, we all can think of, like, some of you, I could say, you remember what happened in 1941, and you go, yes. Or 1963, even I, at five years of age, can remember when Kennedy was assassinated. Or um, we just had the anniversary of 9-11, right? 9-11. And then you have, you, have, you have significant events in, in your life, too. Like, for me, you know, significant events in years of my life, even significant years and events in my life where I knew the Lord clearly spoke to me yeah. or led me in a particular way or a crossroads came in my life, 1980, 1981, 1983, when the Lord saved Cheryl and I both, 1993, 1999. And so you all can have, have events in years like that. And those are all great memories that they pale in comparison here to what King you saw, what the prophet Isaiah saw here. He said, it says he saw the Lord. I mean, I just, there's just not words to describe this. And I preached on Isaiah 6 a few times. I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. And I read somewhere in the past how long that train of the robe would have been if it was filling the temple. It's like, it wasn't like, you know, it was just like just awesome. It was just like magnificent. The train of his robe. One of the things that people love about this church is this long aisle. And so when somebody gets married, if we've had people that grew up here or whatever, grew up in the church, and they remember the long aisle and they want to get married in this church. Or the long aisle, but when the bride comes down the aisle in the train of her robe, you know, coming down the aisle. Here we have the train of the, the robe of the Lord, lofty and exalted, filling the temple. And you got seraphim there, and angels there, and I'm not going to get into the significance of six wings and two covered his face and two covered his feet and with two he flew. One called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. One of Isaiah's favorite designations for God for the Lord was holy. Okay? The Holy One of Israel. In the book of Isaiah, 12 times in chapters 1 through 39, he uses this designation. 14 times in chapters 40 through 66. And so, and there's books written, and there's verses, and there's principles as it relates to God's attributes. Omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent, merciful, loving, kind, patient, all the attributes of, of, of God. And I, and I think it is true to the more to the greater degree that we see the presence of the Lord, right, in His Word, in worship, in Bible study, in prayer, to the greater degree that we see the Lord in that sense we're affected by Him by his character, by his holiness. But the chief attribute here is holiness. I mean, he doesn't say love, love, love is the Lord of hosts, although God is love. He doesn't say merciful, merciful, merciful is the Lord of hosts, although he is merciful. He doesn't say omnipotent, doesn't say omniscient, doesn't say omnipresent. 
doesn't say all those other things, all those characteristics and attributes of God. Holy. Holiness is something God has. Holiness is something that God is. The psalmist says in Psalm 111.9, Holy and awesome is his name. 1 Samuel 2.2 2 says, Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his footstool. Holy is he. <coughs> so that's a good study. Just take your, your concordance. Look up holiness. Look up holiness. Read all the verses about his holiness. If we had greater... Somebody once said to me years ago, John, if we had a greater glimpse of the holiness of God or we saw God and his holiness and had a, a greater, even greater understanding of our sin in light of his holiness, how that would affect us and change us. And really, seeing the holiness of God in that sense is the only thing that really will ever keep us from sinning. Mm. Keep our flesh from wanting what it wants and sin. Is seeing who God is. Seeing his holiness. Mm. Psalm 99, five, Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his footstool. Holy is he. So Isaiah says, the whole earth is full of his glory. And the word glory there, you know, means weight, means heaviness. Um, the idea of weight, heaviness is in view here. The weight, the glory of his presence. That All the choruses that we sang brought all different parts of this out. And the, the, the worship hymns that we sang did as well. And the last chorus that we sang there about holiness and the weight of his presence weight of his presence fall um, really brought that out. So what is the glory of God? The heaviness of God. It's, it's, it's the revelation of who he is. It's the revelation of his attributes. It's the revelation of who he is and who we are in the light of his presence. Do you see that? Can you imagine what it would be like if the glory and the presence of the Lord came upon us like he came upon us like he came upon Isaiah. That would be revival. Mm -hmm. What would it be like for us to see the Lord today? What would seeing Him do to us? Verse 4 says, And the foundations of the thresholds trembled at the voice of Him who called out while the temple was filling with smoke. I don't know. I think of, you know, just this thought just came to my mind just now. You know, you go to a sporting event could be a regular football game or a Super Bowl and you know they come out and sometimes there's smoke going up you know when they introduce the teams and there's 85,000 people worshiping I was saying I was going to I was going to say worshiping <laughs> you know I mean I like sports like anybody they're there worshiping their heroes <laughs> they're dressed up like them <laughs> or a rock star Or a rock star and the, and the music plays and the band's playing and the smoke, whatever they call those things, shooting up in the air while they're playing. And, and we got here the smoke of the temple. I mean, the, the temple was filling with smoke. It, it'd be like we said, like I said earlier, the, the threshold, the, these things shaking, it says here, the thresholds trembled at the voice of him. It'd be like these beams, whatever, these, these things, things holding up the roof, shaking, and smoke coming in the windows, and the presence of the Lord. And in some measure, that's, I, I, I wish that we would approach worship, all of us, corporate worship more that way, that that's what we're expecting, you know, when we go to worship, we go expectantly, or when we go to pray, we go like that, like, I always say, like, as it relates to any of those events, whether it's worship on Sunday morning, it's like, I don't want to miss something that might happen there that day, you know, or whether it's a Bible study, or or your prayer time, your prayer closet. You know, I don't want to miss something that God, I may see something of God that I've not seen before. His presence may, 
just overwhelm me. Um, and, I, and we need that, right? We need that. And I think that would affect how we would approach these things or just, he's holy. He's worthy of my worship. He's worthy of my praise. He's worthy of my, I can even say that, my time in reading his word. In light of him saving me, saving us. So the angels are crying out to one another. The shaking shows the awesome, awesome power and presence of God. I got so overwhelmed here, forgot to do the first fill in the blank. And the holiness of the Lord, he saw. The, we see in the majesty of these first four verses, the majesty and the glory of the Lord. One cried out to another. One called out to another and said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. This whole earth is full of the weight of His presence. And if only the Church of New Life, and if only Pastor John, and Maria, and Sage, and Hunter, and Joan, and Bob, and Kathy, and Scott, and John, and Sh Sharon, and Carol, and Hank, and Ann, and Lou, and Tina, and Amanda, and Dan, and Cheryl, and the kids downstairs, that we were full of the weight, the sense of his glory, and just how he affects us, right? just the weight of his presence, his holiness, the weight of his presence, the glory of his person, which is so overwhelmed and just affect us, right? Certainly in a greater way and a greater measure than it does each day or each month. We can grow in this, okay? So, he saw the majesty and the glory of the Lord. Then, the next slide is, and that's good. This is like, a, this is the gospel, actually, right, John? This is the gospel of Jesus Christ here in Isaiah chapter 6. First, he sees the holiness of, of God, he sees the glory of God, he sees the weight of God's presence and who God is, and then he sees the magnitude and gravity of his sin. He says, Woe is me, for I am rude, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. He sees the holiness, he sees the glory, he sees the weight, the, mag the magnitude, the, the weight of God's presence, he sees the magnitude and gravity of his sin. And if he wasn't <laughs> saved, he'd be saved at that point. And anybody who hears the gospel of Jesus Christ and sees the holiness of God and the glory of God, then they see their sin then they're going to be affected by him and they're going to repent and they're going to turn to Jesus Christ to be saved. Ruined means undone. Ruined means cut down to be brought to silence. Like when Job finally was brought to silence. And then Job 42.6. You read that. Job's going back and forth, God and the counselors that he had there, and then Job in 42. Let me start with verse 1. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things, and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore I have declared that which I did not understand, things too wonderful for me which I did not know. Hear now, and I will speak, and I will ask you, and you will instruct me. I've heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I retract and I repent in dust and ashes. In Luke chapter 5, it says, When Simon Peter saw that, he fell down at Jesus' feet, saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. So the glory of the holiness of God was too much for, obviously, for Isaiah to bear. He says, woe is me. 
I'm undone. Right? Maybe God will crash me into powder right now. Or was it Washington who gave that illustration about, yeah, he gave this illustration about, you know, somebody someday, you know, we're going to stand before God and we're going to have a lot of questions for God. And we're going to ask him this and ask him that. Why did you do this? And how come you did that? He's like, no, you're not. You're gonna, you'd be like a, a waxed figurine. You'll, you'll melt like a waxed figurine in a, in a fire. Right? I'm sorry. You go to one of those pizza places, those brick oven things where they're making the pizza and you show them and you see that and the flame in there. You're like, you'll melt like a, a wax fingering, figurine in a blast furnace. The holiness of God. But thank God there's the mercy of God here too, right? He says, I'm a man of unclean lips. <laughs> Foul, defiled, polluted. And so... That describes us. We're people by nature of unclean lips. We're men and women and boys and girls of unclean lips. And we live among people of unclean lips. It says, and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. My eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. The magnitude and the gravity of his sin. What must have made this so much even more unbearable for him was that it was true. <laughs> okay? It was true of him. He knew who he was. Right? I'm undone. I mean, God may just take me out right now. I'm not worthy to stand in his presence. I'm not worthy to go near to him. But thank God we have the throne of grace. We say mercy and grace to help in time of need. And thank God that he intervened. So that we could enter the Holy of Holies. We could enter into His presence. In fact, it says in Hebrews, Therefore, boldly enter the presence of God and receive mercy and help in time of need. My eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Of the Lord. <laughs> My eyes have seen the King. That would be just... It's an, uh, just make that a prayer. I need to just make that a prayer. Lord, help my eyes to see the King, the Lord of hosts. Maybe, make, maybe I need to make that a daily prayer. Lord, help my eyes to see the King, the Lord of hosts. Lord, help me to see you in your holiness. Help me to see you in the weight of the glory of your presence. Help my eyes to see you. You all know too often the thing that you see and the thing that I see the most is me and the weight of my presence. It's just huge. It's huge. So I live, I'm a man of unclean lips. I live among the people of unclean lips. My eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. So again, this was this was so devastating to him, again, because it's true. Because it's true. Um, our brother says, I won't say his name. You know who he is when I say our brother says. A lot of times he goes, I'm the problem. I, I'm, I'm, I'm the problem. Okay? Me, I'm the problem. And I say to my brother, no, you're not the problem. I'm the problem. <laughs> The, the Times of London, in one of their editorials years back, asked the question, what's wrong? Ask this question. Imagine if the Voices or the Middlebury Bee or the Waterbury Republican put out an ad and they asked this question, what's wrong with the world today? And I, I can imagine what some of the responses would be, you know. I don't know, interesting. Well, there, we need peace and there's war. And actually... They would try to blame somebody. I won't say who they would try to blame, but they would try to blame somebody. He's the problem. Everything that goes wrong, he's the problem. Or she's the problem. So they received responses from people all over the world expressing their view of what was wrong with the world. And one day, they got a letter from G.K. Chesterton, who was a Christian <laughs> author. And he wrote 
a letter to the editor of the Times of London and said, you ask what is wrong with the world? I am. What was the response? I am. And they said they never received another letter like that after that one. So Isaiah is saying, what's wrong? I am the problem. What was me? I am rude. I am unclean. My eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. I see the magnitude and the gravity of my sin. And thank God for verse 6. Verse 6 is the gospel. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which we had taken from the altar with tongues. And he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is forgiven. So that's, this is quite a beautiful um, bunch of verses here. Touched my mouth with it. And he said, Behold. That's a really great behold. That behold is like, Look at this. That behold is the gospel of Jesus Christ. God initiated the action and took away the iniquity of Isaiah. So there's propitiatory propitiation there. There's a, that, that coal touched his lips, because he said he's a man of unclean lips, touched his lips, and he was cleansed. And that's the picture of what Jesus Christ does for each and every person. For whom he saves. And, the, and you got that. You all know you have a campfire. Actually, we went camping with Nate and Jolene a long, long time ago. I've camped once or twice in my life. I'm not a camper. Cheryl talked me into it. She bought all the paraphernalia and we went to Rocky Neck? Somewhere. Pam announced it somewhere. And we camped and we had the campfire and we had the, the s'mores, you know, and you make them. And, and so somehow, you know, Nate and Jolene always like to fool around and mess around. Somehow, a hot, hot coal from the fire came out. Jolene did something and it knocked, it landed on Nate somewhere. And he just got, he didn't really give her, and there was no really mark or anything, but it was, it was a little bit of a story of the hot coal there. You get that picture there of the, of the, of the hot coal, the flame. And that's like a picture of the purity there, right? Of uh, the sacrifice there that um, was being made. It is iniquities taken away. And we need to have a greater understanding, church. We need to have a greater appreciation, church, of the fact that our iniquity has been taken away. Amen. Our past, present, future iniquities, sin, has been taken away. It's great to know we're saved. Our name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life. It's also great to know about that process of sanctification that's going on in light of the holiness of God. I'm going to stay. You're going to stay where you are in whatever position you're presently are, or I am, or any one of us is in our relationship with the Lord. We're going to stay there, you know, in our little comfort zone area. I said to Cheryl last night, we were just talking about something, and and I said, you know, you remember though, you, do you remember one curse she does remember? Years ago, and I've heard this illustration with you before, I said, where, you know, I'd come home, this I'd be like probably in my 30s, 20, maybe even my 20s, 30s, whatever I was in, and I'd come home and I'd be like, you know, upset, disappointed, depressed, frustrated, blah, 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 blah. And Cheryl would say to me, what's the matter? Your circumstances weren't so good today? When I think about that, it's like the self and the flesh there. And I'm a little bit different, but not much different from that. Actually, I'm worse, like Paul said. Like Paul said, the, 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 what, how does the sequence go, brother? I had it in my notes. The sequence goes, on the leader. you remember the sequence of Paul? It ends up, yeah. you know, chief of sinners. Yeah. The trustworthy saying is there's full acceptance that Jesus... Christ Jesus came in the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. I am chief. Yeah, I went from the least of the apostles to the chief of sinners. You know? So, in light of the holiness of God, in light of the weight of the glory of His presence, in light of the fact that our name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, He's taken away our sin and our iniquity. He's cleansed us through the propitiatory sacrifice of Christ on the cross. We're not, we just want to stay like we are presently. We want to grow in Christ's likeness. We want to grow 
and holiness. And he says, your sin is forgiven. And so for the believers in Christ, that has happened. Has that happened to you? Has your sin been forgiven? And so we pray, Lord, help us to grasp the weight of the fact that our sin has been taken away by you. So, he saw the holiness of the Lord. He saw the majesty and the glory of the Lord. He saw the magnitude and gravity of his sin. And then, verses 8 through 13, which you could spend a, a, a lifetime on, the next slide, um, the ministry given to him by the sovereign Lord. I see the weight of the glory of the Lord's presence and the train of his robe filling the temple, and the smoke, and the pillars shaking, and he sees the magnitude of the sin. I am undone. And then he sees the ministry given to him by the Lord. No wonder why he would say, I don't even care what you're going to ask me to do, God, right now. Here I am. Send me. What an attitude. <laughs> Talk about I don't know if we had an attitude adjustment or not. Sometimes I need an attitude adjustment. Sometimes we need an attitude adjustment. It's like, here I am, Lord. Send me. He said, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Who will, <laughs> whom shall I send and who will go for us? I'd be like, okay, well, where do you want me to go, God? And uh, when do you want me to go, God? And, well, let me check my schedule. Not the daytime, but the phone's up there. My schedule. What do you want me to go? Uh, I'm not so sure. I got something else I got to do there, God. Um, no, there's no, there's no, there's none of that here. It's just like, here I am, God, send me, I'll go. What? The weight of the world. The weight of the Lord's presence and the glory of His presence and the holiness of God to so overwhelmed him. And then in light of that, he sees himself and he sees his sin and the magnitude of his sin. It's like, okay, I don't care what i got to do right now and I don't care what my schedule is. It's like, I, what, is, what else am I going to do? Lord, I'm going to fall down on my face and worship and praise you and want to serve you whatever way and whatever capacity I can serve you in, in my area of giftedness, calling. And sometimes, you know, God may ask you to do something that you've never done before. <laughs> Here I am. Send me. His response is immediate. Why? Why? Why was his response immediate? I don't know. Maybe a moment before that he thought he'd be struck down dead. <laughs> maybe a moment before him he's like, I'm undone. Whoa, it's me. Whoa. That's a whoa, it's me. Not whoa, like Fonzie. This is like, whoa, it's me. I'm undone. There's no hope. And so then he, so why would he say that? Here I am sending him. Again, he thinks he's undone. He thinks there's no hope. He thinks it's all over. And then he's given the assurance of forgiveness. His lips cleansed. and He's given the assurance of God's presence. One minute he's thinking maybe God will blanish him forever from his presence. No wonder he'd be like, yes, here I am. Send me. What is it? What do you want me to do, God? And that readiness to serve, brothers and sisters, is a mark of faith. The readiness to serve is a mark of true faith. So even before the prophet knows what the Lord wants him to do, he's willing to do it. And after he's told what he's going to be, what he's doing, he's still willing to go. Verses 9 and 10 says, Go and tell this people, keep on listening, but do not proceed. Keep on looking. But do not understand. Render the hearts of this people insensitive, their ears dull, and their eyes dim. Otherwise they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and return and be healed. <laughs> well, let me check my schedule. Let me see if I can do it. 
no, I really can't do it. Well, how's it going to come out? <laughs> God, oh, okay, I'm going to do thus and such for you, and um, there's going to be a great result and fanfare and appreciation, maybe, or, or even blessing of people, you know, being saved, or, or you're doing... No, you may have work sometimes called. You all know, though, I don't have to tell you, you know it by experience, too. It's not if we're called to do something, and it's like there's no... Said you get kicked in the teeth, or said you get persecuted, or, or you get gray hair, or you get trials, trouble, tribulations, difficulties. Then your circumstances are not so good, and then you're depressed. I'm speaking about me. And so he's called to do something there that was like hard. And you know what? That's the picture of the gospel, too. Because sometimes when God's word goes out, you all know it has one or two effects. They're cut to the quick, like in Acts chapter 2. What must I do to be saved? And they repent and they turn to Jesus. Or they're cut to the quick, like in Acts chapter 7, same phrase, when they were stoning Stephen and they want to kill him. And they do kill him. Those are like the two responses. Now, another response is just also indifference, too. So he gets this. This is the gospel, you know, this is why we could spend a whole long time on this. The gospel has a, can have a hardening effect on the heart of the people. The word has a hardening effect on the one that doesn't turn to him in repentance. The one who will not listen, the one who will not yield. A person who continually rejects God's word becomes hardened in their sin. And it says in Hebrews that they're hardened in their sin to a point that there'll no longer be a sacrifice remaining for them. They're like, just given it over. It's like, it'll be too late. No one knows when that is. God is still sovereign over, God is sovereign over that. Actually, let's highlight a ministry given to him by the sovereign Lord. By the sovereign Lord. And then, it says in 11 through 13, how long? <laughs> I'd be like, I don't know, do I really want to go? I mean, we measure everything in this world by certain measures of the success that we're going to have, or the ease with what we're going to have. Again, yeah, I could do that. That'll fit into my schedule. I can do that if it fits into my schedule. It's like, how long? It says, oh, until cities are devastated without inhabitants, houses are without people, and the land is utterly desolate. The Lord has removed men far away. This is speaking about the exile. God told them, until the nation was completely destroyed, really, sent into exile at the hand of the Assyrians. How long must I remain at this painful, discouraging task? Well, in the light of the holiness of God, and in the light of the weight of the sin, his own sin, in the light of the majesty of God, however long, Lord, you want me to do it, I do it because I don't. I do it because we do it unto the glory and honor of Him, right? And we're not our own, and we were bought with a price. We don't belong to ourselves, and were He not the one who saved us and touched us and cleansed us, we would be forever separated from Him in hell. In eternal separation from him, weeping and gnashing of teeth. All right. Flip the page to starting to think about applying the truth. I, I guess the, the obvious one is let's really, let's, let's worship our sovereign Lord. And we're going to be doing that in eternity. Revelation 5, 13. And every created, and we're going to be serving him throughout eternity too. And every, every, oh, every created thing which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all things in them, I heard them saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. Be blessing and glory and honor forever. Endeavor. So we worship. We're called to worship Him with our lives, with our lives being a sacrifice of worship to Him. 
with our lives being given over to Him. We're to worship Him corporately uh, when we gather together with our brothers and sisters in Christ. We're to worship Him privately, publicly. Psalm 29, 1 says, and 2 says, Ascribe to the Lord, all sons of the Almighty. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due to His name. Worship the Lord in His holy array. Worship our Sovereign Lord. This just thought occurred to me. You know how else we worship the Sovereign Lord? Our obedience to Him. And our repentance to Him. Worship Him. There's so many different scriptures that talk about our lives and our sacrifices that we make to God in our service, in our worship. Prayer is another one. Philippians 2, 9 through 11 comes to mind right here. Let's worship our sovereign Lord. You know those verses, right? In Philippians chapter 2. For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed upon him a name which is above every name. So the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is to is that Jesus is Christ, that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory and honor of the Father, to the glory and honor of the Father. Every created thing will worship. I think I've heard it said here, some will, will bow the knee willingly. For some, he'll break their kneecaps, so to speak. All those that rejected him, and they'll bow down and worship him, and then be cast forever away out of his presence. Revelation 4, 8 through 11. I'm coming quickly. Hold fast what you've had, so that no one will take your crown. He who overcomes, I'm well, reading chapter 3, sorry. 4, 8 through 11, and, and the four living creatures, each one of them having six wings, are full of eyes around and within, and each day and night, they do not cease to say, you know this, right? They do not cease to say, same thing we're reading in Isaiah, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Lord Almighty, who was and who is to come. That will be the song that will be playing throughout all of eternity. And when the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, to him who lives forever and ever. And the 24 elders will fall down before him who sit on the throne and will worship the one who lives forever and ever. And will cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, O Lord, our God, to receive glory. Same phrase is right there. Glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and because of your will they existed and were created. So worship, let's worship, let's worship our sovereign Lord, really worship Him with our obedience, really worship Him with our repentance, really worship Him with expressing our desire to be changed and conformed into His image and likeness. And the next slide is, let's pursue holiness. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of the flesh, and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of the Lord. Amen. For sake of time, I'm not going to read 2 Corinthians 6, some verses there, but the therefore that goes before chapter 7, verse 1, points us back at least to chapter 6. So just read that on your own, and, and the verses just prior to this talk about coming out from um, that which is unclean. You know the famous verses in 2 Corinthians 6. Don't be bound together with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? He says, I dwell among them, I'll walk among them, and I'll be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, he says in verse 17, come out from them. Come out from their midst. Be separate, says the Lord. Don't touch what is unclean. So that's a, that's a call to all of us to pursue holiness, to come out from that which is unclean, to come out from that which is sin and disobedience, and disobedience to the Lord. 
You know, what's our motivation to do that? Verse 17 at the end says, and if you do that, if we do that, and we pursue holiness, and we move away from it, move away from our sin to holiness, says, and I will welcome you. He says, I will welcome you. God says, I will welcome you with an overwhelming sense of my presence. I will welcome you. 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16 talks about being holy. 1 Thessalonians 5, says, 1 Peter says, be holy, for I am holy. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 and 24 says, now may the God of peace himself, this is a great hope and promise from God's word. I need to go to bed with this verse and wake up with this verse. May the God, and go to sleep with this verse and wake up with this verse. May the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. And may your spirit, soul, and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he who calls you, and he will bring it He'll to pass. It. That's a great message there. Amen. He will bring it to pass. We participate in that in some measure with pursuing holiness and sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. And it's, it's, it's banking on He will bring it to pass. He will complete it. Hebrews 12, 14 says, follow, let me read it from the NASB first. Hebrews 12, 14. This is a serious call to the unsaved person. It's also a call to um, it's a call to the church. It's a call to believers. It says in Hebrews 12, 14, pursue peace with all men. Imagine if we just took that seriously. Amen. Let's just pursue peace with all men. As much as it depends upon us, look with peace with each other in the body of Christ and outside of the body of Christ. And that's sometimes hard to do. I think of, I can't do that because we're running out of time, but I think of this illustration recently, you know, something I'm dealing with, with my older child and children and new husband, and they're telling me stuff that I was supposed to do, and I won't go into that, and, 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 and I'm like, well, that's not, we really, and I just want to blast them, blast him, blast them at some point. And, um, no, it's like pursue peace with all men. Love. It says, and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. Imagine, you take that to the bank. You take that seriously in the midst of your sin, in the midst of your rebellion, in the midst of your transgression. It's like, pursue sanctification, pursue holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. Oh, you're saying I can lose my salvation? No. But God's word says, pursue Say, pursue holiness. King James says, pursue holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Not from the legalistic sense, not from the cowering and fear of being struck down dead by God, but if that's what it takes, then that's okay. Out of fear and reverence for God, repent, repent, pursue holiness without which no one will see the Lord. So the person who professes, this is so obvious on a lower level, so the person who professes Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, who says that they're the Lord's, who says that they belong to Him, who was baptized, who said the prayer, who whatever, and is living totally contrary to God's Word, totally contrary to what God's principles say. They're not pursuing holiness at all. God says to those that person, you're not going to see the Lord. And God says to John Stephen, and even to us as believers in Christ, we continue in our sin. We're not going to lose salvation to that sense. But it's like, I want to, I still want to pursue holiness. And, and, and maybe I won't finish the race if I give up and go apostate and don't fight my flesh and don't turn to the Lord. And one of the evidences that you are the Lord's is that you are affected by your sin. And you confess it and you want to repent and you're asking God, please help me. Please help me to repent. Because it's so hard for me even to repent because of my flesh. If you're not doing that kind of warfare and that kind of battle, then maybe we're not the Lord's. Someone's not the Lord's. I'm just saying what it says here. Pursue peace with all men and holiness without which 
no one will see the Lord, so somebody's in danger of not seeing the Lord, somebody there. But the hope is, Matthew 5, 8, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Mm -hmm. All right, next slide. Mm -hmm. Have you recognized and repented of your sin before a holy God? Just the one verse there. I'm going to want to move along. As for me, I said, O oh Lord, be gracious to me. Heal my soul, for I have sinned against you. So the not yet believer, the unsaved person, the person maybe watching this on social media, the call there is, do you understand or recognize that God is holy and that you're a sinner and you're separated from God? Will you repent of your sin and turn to Jesus Christ to forgive you of your sin? And if, you're, if God calls you to do that and you live somewhere around this vicinity, come here and tell us that. We'd love to celebrate that with you. That the Lord touched your heart and that the Lord saved you. If you recognize and repented of your sin, 2 Corinthians 6 2 says, Today is the day of salvation. Last application slide is God invited me to some area of service to Him, or some new area of service to Him, or some area of service to Him where maybe you've been reluctant to say, Here I am, send me for whatever the reasons. The people said to Joshua, We will serve the Lord our God and we will obey His voice. Where does it say? He says somewhere else there, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And if you read, and I won't do it because we're finishing up for sake of time, but Joshua 24, 19 through 24, the verses that go ahead of that, but also, I do want to read verse 29. Verse 29 says, it came about after these things that Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord. I guess that would be a real good on your tombstone verse. Here lies the servant of the Lord. He died being 110 years old. I guess that means, too, it's never too old. You're never too old to be a servant of the Lord. So Isaiah saw the holiness of the Lord. He saw the majesty and the glory of the Lord. He saw the magnitude and the gravity of the sin. He saw the ministry given to him by the sovereign Lord. The foundational question is how will we respond or how am I being led by God to respond to the holiness of the Lord? Isaiah 6, 3 says, And to one call to another, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of your glory. So what about 74 Kelly Road Extension? It says, The whole earth is full of your glory. I should have looked up all your addresses. <laughs> I only can think of. What about, third, what about North Park Drive? What about hmm. Bronson Road? What, I mean, I won't give out your addresses or names. <laughs> what about those places? With the glory of the Lord fill those places? What would it be like for those places to be full of God's glory? I have this illustration and I know I'm going to read it to you because it's really long. Alright, it's, it's, I'm not going to read the whole thing. We're, we're almost done. It's in the Herald of His Coming for May. Holiness as a Fruit of Revival by John McGregor. And it talks about how this revival came to this Indian reservation and they were hearing this man give the gospel and he kept saying, could you stay a little longer? Could you stay a little longer? He started on Friday. Could you stay Saturday? The plane's not coming until Tuesday. Could you stay Sunday? The plane's not coming until Tuesday. Can you stay Monday and preach? The plane's not coming to Tuesday afternoon. Can you come back Tuesday morning and keep preaching? The plane's not coming till Tuesday afternoon. So this went on and on. And they had experienced revival here. Um, what, the people were praying one night. They, they started praying like 11 o'clock. And at, at 7 o'clock in the morning, they were still praying because they were affected by the weight of the glory of God's presence. And so they said to this, as he says here, it's not the end of the story. Just like Isaiah, the dear brother was undone. His idea about himself was broken. He was not what he thought he was. And at 7 o'clock in the morning, he said to me, John, the plane doesn't come back till 11 o'clock. Could you come over to my house for a cup of tea? He goes, don't forget, 
We've been there all night. Now it's 7.30 in the morning, and I'm sipping tea at his home, and he said, I want you to see something. And he brought his six children out of bed into the living room, and he lined them up in order of age. Then that man went to his oldest boy and said to him on his knees, Son, you haven't seen Christ in me. Will you forgive me? That boy put his arms around his dad and said, I love you, Dad. I forgive you. And the father went right down the line. And then he says, I kept track of that family, and I want to tell you about them. The oldest boy's in the university now, and he's working hard for Jesus. The next one was a girl. She's finishing up high school. She's one of the most active students in that school for Jesus. Why is that? Why is it that all six of the children are living and walking with Jesus? It's because that mother and father that night were broken from looking into the face of a holy God and serving Him for who He is and seeing themselves for who they are. That is a living illustration of what repentance is. And then this quote, Lord, what must happen to me before I see you? What must change in my prayer life? What must be confessed and cleansed? Here I am, Lord. I surrender. Take me, break me, and mold me. Until we just pray that and continue to prayer along those lines. Jesus, thank you. Holy Spirit, thank you. Thank you that we... Oh, Lord, just help us to apply. Help us to see it. A new or fresh. Help us to see the holiness of the Lord, the weight and glory of your presence, our sin in the light of your presence, our being cleansed by you in the light of your presence, our call to serve you in the light of your presence, our call to repent. Well, we need that kind of change uh, at 74 Kelly Road Extension, and we need that kind of change in our households, in our workplaces, in our schools. Well, we need that kind of change. We need the weight of the glory of your presence to fall upon us in greater way and in greater measure. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.